Yeah, I'm Eric, and uh, it doesn't say here, but I'm a Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute student and also Cambridge University student, just finishing up. So, just present work that we recently published, and then I'll motivate some some problems we're trying to resolve. Uh, so, uh, over over time, genomes replicate with error, and this gives rise to variation. We think of this as forming a phylogenetic tree, of this kind. Uh, but when we typically do bioinformatic analyses, we pick one reference genome from this tree, and we base everything around that, which is problematic because then this biases us against those other variations that exist in nature, which we may know about, uh, and this causes distortions in our analyses and various kinds of issues. Uh, and so what we can do is to build a structure that includes all the variation we're aware of in one uh, unified system, which we'll call a variation graph. And in, in this system, uh, we, we have nodes which have, have sequence labels attached to them um, and, and IDs, and edges between them show, uh, represent allowed linkages between, between these sequences. So if we walk through the graph following these edges, then we can, uh, we, we've, we've built a model of all different genomes of, of, that are related to this kind of structure. And so this, this model is Markovian, so it has no memory, and this is a problem for a lot of the things we do. But to make this equivalent to the genomes that we put in, we can label the graph with paths that, that record the, the original genomes that we used to build it, which you here show below. And in this figure, maybe a little more clearly, we can see them as, as runs, as these colored bars that go between the different nodes. Um, and another way to think about this is, is as a, a linearized, we can make a linearization of the system and, and think of things as coverages across that linearized object, uh, which in, in some applications may be much easier to work with. So it doesn't have to have the topological complexity of a very complicated graph. It can actually be a linear thing. And, and, and over the past four years, uh, I've worked with a group of other people to implement a reference, kind of reference implementation of, of methods based around these graphical systems, uh, methods for resequencing, uh, methods for, uh, for alignment to this graph, methods to do variant calling on top of it, and to incorporate annotations into the graph and, and use them as a, as a basis space for semantic um, linked data applications. And, and so this has culminated in a publication that came out just a few months ago, um, which some of the authors are present in the room. And here are just a few results from that to give you an idea of what we can do. We build a, a variation graph out of the human whole genome and the variants from the Thousand Genomes Project. The Human Thousand Genomes Project has about 5,000 haplotypes, so it's as if we've made a single reference that includes 5,000 genomes. And this takes us uh, a, some time to do. It's not quite as fast as working with a linear reference, but we can, can build the index and build, uh, build a, the graph and build indices on top of it in, in, a, in several days. Once we have those, we can then map reads against it very efficiently. Um, so in this case, I'm showing a, a list of different uh, different size graphs that include different numbers of variants. The top has no variants. The next one has all of them. As we go down, we filter out lower and lower frequency. Or sorry, we filter out uh, higher and higher frequency variants, um, ultimately ending up with uh, only variants above 10 percent frequency. And and just to, to give a taste of how you could use this, this is a, a simulation where we took a sample that we don't know the truth in, and and we simulate reads from that sample, map them to the reference uh, genome, and or we map them to the pan genome. And, and we can see that when we map to the, uh, to the pan genome, in the aggregate, we, we do slightly worse than when we map to the linear reference, which you may say is problematic. And it, the difference is very small, though, in this particular case. So on the, on the top, you see these paired end curves. The, the red is the pan genome, and the green and blue are two different mappers against the linear reference. When we consider all the reads, we do worse, but when we look at reads that have any variant, so the farthest to the right, um, actually, can I point at this? Yeah. So the farthest to the right, we see that uh, we see that we do significantly better with, with reads mapped to the pan genome. And so, you know, if you're considering variation, which is what you should do when you're doing resequencing, this will this will help you. And another way to look at it is to see that we can remove bias to, to indel variants that exist in, uh, in the, if we put them into the reference graph. And so here we have these three curves. The green one on the bottom and the blue one are, are cases where we're mapping against the linear reference without any information about the variation. Uh, one is, this is BWA-MEM and this is VG. 
Um, but when we have the variance in the graph, the indel variance in the graph, we, we don't have any reference bias at all. We, we map equally to both alleles, either to the indel containing allele or to the reference allele. And this is not, not just for, for simple graphs that are made from these linear BCF files that are directed and cyclic, but we can use any kind of graph as well as a basis reference. So in this case, we've done a progressive assembly of seven whole genome uh, yeast de novo assemblies to each other, and it makes this kind of complicated structure here. If we look into it, we see that there are these weird junctions between different chromosomes that occur because of translocations over evolutionary time. But in fact, uh, zooming into those, we see that they themselves, the, the arms of this graph, the bubbles, are actually pretty linear. And so this is a very natural system still to work on as a, as a kind of reference system. And uh, we can align long reads to it, in fact, and see that we align the reads better to the graph than not, which you can see from the, the shift in density in this plot to the lower right. Um, and, and just to give a taste of some other applications, we built a, a viral metagenome from, from some freshwater lakes in Svalbard. And if you look, if you zoom in close to it, you see that it looks like little viruses. They're circular fragments, um, very small. And if we align reads to the graph relative to the contigs made from this assembly, we again align better to the graph. And then in fact, align the reads full length to the graph. And, and finally, just to show that this is it's not just for alignment, but also for understanding data, uh, this is a human gut microbiome. It's been assembled with a, an assembler called Minia 3, and, and then visualized with a technique called bandage. And you can see this very distinctive structure where there's two bulbous regions that and this kind of suggestive, suggestive connection between them. Um, and, and actually, these correspond to, to the, the clades of bacteria that are present in the gut. And, and shows immediately the size of those clades, the diversity of them, and also that there's some kind of sharing or conserved genes between them. Um, so finally, I'll talk about a few things that we're doing to extend these approaches to make them more, more scalable. So one of the problems we often have is that we have a bunch of whole genomes we've already assembled and we'd like to build them into a single graph. So, so doing this in low memory is difficult. I've developed an application that lets us do that. We're using disk-backed uh, sorts and indices on, on the set of alignments. We take a set of alignments from a, a very fast aligner called Minimap2, can turn them into a particular file type called PATH, can filter those as we'd like, and then we sequish them into a single graph. Uh, and this, this is a, a way forward, I think, in, in terms of building references. And just to give a, a sense of things you can do with that, you, this is the, the same yeast strains from the previous figure that I showed. Um, they've been assembled uh, without any filter on the uh, length of the alignments. And you can see this collapse in the middle, which is that basically we're representing one copy of the transposon class, the, the common transposon class of all of the, the genomes. But if we do a filter on the alignment length, we get something that's much more unfolded and a bit more, more linear, and it might be easier to work with. Uh, and so finally, I want to talk about a few open problems. Um, what is the next steps in this space? So we have, we know we have these standard data formats for these kinds of pangenomes, but they're useful mostly in assembly. And we need, we need techniques to really represent all the kinds of data we use in resequencing, and not just to make the representations, but to make them in a way that they're adoptable by the community. Um, so another thing is we can build these whole genome alignment graphs, but then, then using them is not easy. These, become, these are very big files, they're hard to index, they're, they become difficult to partition, uh, and so this needs work in order to, uh, to resolve. And uh, yeah, we, we have solutions to many of these things in graphical plan genomics. We can do resequencing with VG, but this is just a reference implementation. These aren't the optimal solutions to these problems, and they are not necessarily most usable. And, and so that in general, this, this space needs more effort. Uh, and finally, and relevant to this, this conference in particular, uh, we know how to represent VGs in RDF. They have a lossless representation. But that doesn't mean that we've actually used it for anything practical. So although we know that, you know, in principle, that this semantic representation of this kind of graph is very useful, we haven't, we haven't shown that that's useful in any particular place. So this, this just needs effort in terms of consideration. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to I'm stuck. Yeah, so I'd just like to, to point out that although this may appear complicated, there is a simple way to, to approach these, 
these systems, we can think of them as linear, and we have coverages across them, uh, mean that we can have a vectorized representation of, of the data space uh, that, that's very simple to work with. And uh, with that, I'd just like to thank everyone who's worked on this project and for your attention. Thanks. Thank you.